here we go. Hello, and welcome to Making Sense of It. I'm Mona Duncan, your moderator. And do you ever wonder why you do the things you do? Well, this program is for you from the uh, Glasser Institute for Choice Theory. That uh, all we do, all of our behavior is purposeful, but sometimes we may scratch our head and say, well, why did I do that? So this morning, uh, August has five Wednesdays. And uh, anyway, we just kind of come up with a, a fun idea here this morning. Wendell Walker is going to be doing three official weeks on the 10th, the 17th, and the 24th. But today, not really knowing the newsletter from the Institute hadn't gone out yet. So we decided to just have this as a random dialogue. And... Uh, Thinking, maybe looking primarily at um, what it is about choice theory that you have just really embraced and how it has been effective to you. And then also, what are the areas that may be a little bit questioning as to, I'm not so sure about that. So we want to just talk about that today. And welcome everyone, and uh, it's good to be here. So uh, we were chatting before I put the recording on. So Wendell, you want to take it from there? Um, with a mouthful of we, had, um, we were reflecting on the recent floods in Kentucky um, and the significant loss of property and lives and hopes and dreams and whatever. And um, um, I was... I was saying while ago that uh, they interviewed a woman who just, she and her family had just lost their home, their farm equipment, the car, the truck, whatever, everything, literally everything. And, you know, you could just see the pain and, and you'd say, what would I do? And this woman said, well, and, and I, maybe the interviewer would say, well, what are you going to do? And this woman said, well, I can't dwell on this. We're just going to have to start over. And I was just, I was just, I stopped in my tracks at, at the insight and the, I, didn't, I don't even have a good word to say it. The, I don't know, the courage, the, 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 the logic, the whatever. Of, of them saying, in effect, she was saying, I'll grieve later. It's got to start over. And then, then that uh, prompted you to think about one way, uh, Mona, that you see things about this circle. You, would you go back through that again? Well, you had asked, how could someone just, you know, accept all that so much? Yeah. And I know my but, philosophy in life has become over the past 25, 30 years that it is what it is. You know, we can fight against it, but it is what it is. Yeah. And then not only looking at it is what it is, but now what, so what? And oh. I don't mean that ugly, hateful, in your face. Now, what are we going to do? Because life is circle cyclical. And it keeps going on. Uh, yeah, like that circle. You know, you can start at this point, but you keep going no matter whether it's the orbit around the earth or whatever, but you come back to the starting place. And when you come back to that starting place, yes, it may be completely disheveled, but um, what are we going to do? And in working with clients and stuff, I ask quite frequently, I say, Have you, do you ever ask yourself, why me? I mean, this house was left unharmed and this one was totally destroyed. Have you ever asked yourself why me? But let's get a little deeper. Have you ever asked yourself why not me? Mm. It's as though we're privileged and, you know, I'm not supposed yeah. to get sick. I'm not supposed to have financial difficulty. It's, you know, why? So why don't we ever ask ourselves why not me? And it's it's life. It is the cycle of life. And it's not all joys and hunky dory, but there's more joys than there are. Well, I don't know. Maybe they, yeah. they met, the joys and the sorrows may kind of even out. But a lot of it has to do with the way we see things and the choices we make in seeing those. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of television shows, uh, you know, 
written dramas. I'm watching a good many of the uh, Law and Order kind of things, and I'm watching NCIS and what have you. And <clears throat> um, well, in, in, in stories of high um, uh, stories about uh, people you know, going to war, Afghanistan, Iraq, and a buddy gets killed, but not this person. And then this person has all sorts of, of, of uh, it should have been me. And then I should have been able to save him. And, and coming, coming home, maybe even escorting the casket, that sort of thing. And, and the significant depression and, and self-shaming maybe uh, that, that I survived and the others didn't. And uh, so those are interesting therapeutic things for, for helping people to figure that out. You said something a while ago that I'd heard a long time ago. You said two thirds of it, and it and, and it's, it's a, here's here's a, a counseling technique. It's called what, so what, now what? Yes. And you said that well, it's very good, and it it tracks with uh, reality therapy. So what's going on in your life now? Okay, all right. And and how is this impacting your life that brings you into to, to therapy? To counseling? Uh, okay. And um, so then, then you're moving to now what? You know, where, where are you? It's, it's a nice, simple little framework there too. And I have such a faith in a benevolent being. Uh -huh. that put this world into being to start with mm -hmm. and that it really is it's love it's the depth of love it's the you know and it regardless I mean in working with the prison system uh every time someone would come through they had a different faith I'd research it and you know what their search me they're they're all pretty much close to there's 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 absolutes that are there in every way, and they have very solid ground to build on. And just to know that this benevolent being is really on our side. And with the person that, you know, in the war and the buddy was killed and they felt responsible for it, those things are too big for us to carry. And the more we try to carry them, it's to lovingly, and it does have to be with love. Yeah. Do not yeah. carry more yeah. than we're capable of. Well, you're hitting too on one of the key um, uh, tenets or phrases in substance abuse work let go and let God. Right. You right. know, do you have control over that? And you just let that be since you don't and trust that other people are, are you know and it's interesting how it works out um can i can i chime in sure oh yeah not right now well yes, i hope can. i'm again I'm, i apologize for being late no, no. Um, You're I, here. Uh, I hope i'm fitting in properly and and i'm going to implement a choice theory concept first uh what's in it for me uh can you repeat those three W's no. or three three questions? What well, my philosophy is, and now what? Say it again. Say what? again. Well, he was saying he was using the wobbling. Remember, wobbling says everybody's listening goes around listening to radio station W I I F M in their head all day long, and then you say, "What does that stand for?" And he says. What's in it for me? That's what James brought up there. It's a wonderful technique. And so, it, it, so that's the key if, if you're talking with people is to say. You, would, in, yeah. you said a couple of W's that Mona had constructed or a couple of questions that Mona had constructed. Um, what's going on in your life now? And now what? But there was why a not, third why one. Me, why not me? I'm sorry. One more time. Yeah. Go ahead. You, 
Mona. Why me and why not me? Okay, and Wendell, say the three W phrases, oh, sure. the three what phrases. Yeah, it's a nice one. Uh, what? So what? Okay. Now what? Okay, I had it correct. I thought I'd left yeah, something yeah, out. It's, Thank it's, you. It's, yeah, I've heard it before, if it hadn't been. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a wonderful little guideline. What? what? So what? Now what? Yeah. So, so I come into you and you say, what brings you in? What is going on in your life right now? Uh, uh, what, are, what are you concerned about? What's the status of things? The what gathering all the, the, as we used to call it present behavior. And I kind of expanded it to present situation. What's your present situation? We know if the person has either voluntarily come in for counseling or has been mandated this is the beauty of choice well, one of the 700 beauties of choice theory we know if they come in voluntarily or mandated that something in their life is not the way they want it their skills are. so so what brings you in well my the judge sent me mm -hmm. um and and so and what did the judge say? Well, he thinks she, he thinks I've got an alcohol problem. What do you say? I don't have a problem. Okay, so you've come in here, but you don't have any problems. Well, then you could go. There's no need for me to waste your time nor mine. It sounds like you've got everything under control and you've got no problems. Right. Well, yeah, but but the judge sent me. Oh, what what's well? What's the judge expecting? Well, all you have to do is write a letter saying I don't have a problem. Well, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I could do it, I guess, but I I'd be lying. I'm not going to do that. I'd get, I'd have to get to know you. <laughs> but it's so easy sometimes. That's why uh, reality therapy. Now with the Choice Theory Foundation is so effective with drug and alcohol and corrections because reality is right there in the face. And uh, I've seen think they're doing this, but all they're doing is kind of irritating people. Right. Yeah, look at you. Well, so how did you get on to the topics of um, spirituality and AA? I asked Mona. We're freelancing today. I asked Mona. Uh, I, I, I know of Mona's significant religious, spiritual uh, perspective. Thread, not thread, mm -hmm. but but the biggest part of her. The guiding, maybe guiding the guiding force in her life, uh, she comments at times. And I ask her about um, how she deals with people who say, "Well, you know, why did why did my house get torn down by the tornado and not the? Why did God send the tornado to my house but not over there to Sharon's house?" You know. And so we we were talking about that a little bit. And uh, and I was sharing that. In working with the federal prison system, every time a parishioner, every time a felon came in that had a different faith than I was aware of, I would check it out, you know, do some. And there's so much truth. I mean, I don't really like to use the term religion because I just think it is a benevolent essence that is very, very real and that everyone has has an encounter with it, just like there is a benevolent, I mean, a malevolent essence that is very, very evil. And every one of us have had some kind of a meeting with that essence. And as we see and listen to the one that is most loving and most protective of, and um, everything will be okay. And, you know, if it's, if it's, if things aren't getting better, then it's not the end. Everything will be okay in the end. And if it's six months from now, it's not getting better, then the end isn't here yet. 
whatever the end is. And so uh -huh. Wendell was going to share whenever he was his biblical. Uh, I'll come back to that. Jim started this by saying he had something he hmm. wanted to say, but he also wanted to find out how we kind of got where we were. But you were about ready to, to ask or say something. Well, Wendell and I have known each other a long time, and I really um, have, have over the years just been so glad to have Wendell's friendship and support. And it's not like we're tied at the hip or anything, but it's, and it's, you know, we've had long periods where we didn't talk or communicate, but whenever I've had something, Wendell's always been there to support me and he's always been very kind. And in the, in my initial trainings, we, we actually hooked up a number of times at these conferences and stuff and just got to know each other and did some workshops in Cherokee and there, that down there. Um, and I've appreciated Mona and Sharon, your friendships as well in these meetings, but there's some things that Wendell hasn't had a chance to get to know about me and changes in my life in the past few years. One of them is that I've been a Gideon for a number of years. And um, I don't know if you folks know what that is, but- I do. Okay. So um, I had interviewed in the state system starting in about 1996. And um, a friend of mine was encouraging me to do that. He was running a facility at a PhD in family therapy. And uh, we could not figure out why I couldn't get in. I interview typically very well. Um, but I was never getting in. And he found out eventually, it took probably a year or two before he found out that my resumes and applications weren't even getting by the first secretary because they didn't recognize what a master's degree was. They were looking for a high school diploma stuff. All sorts of reasons and excuses. I finally, I probably interviewed about four times on average per year, sometimes six or six or eight times in a year for the state system. I got hired, um, I was in vocational rehab for a while, but as far as getting in the addiction institutes or addiction agencies, it took me till 2016. 10 years, right? Almost, or uh, yeah, almost 20 years. So when I got in, I was in there about two months. And the, the second day I was there, everybody wanted me out. Most everybody wanted me out. How I got in was very peculiar. Um, somebody changed the interview process and got the, the guy that ran the agency. He didn't want me. I had driven four hours for the interview. And they one of the interviewees didn't show up. And so they were going to tell me to go home. And he didn't want me to have to drive four hours there and four hours back without doing the interview. So he got special permission from Raleigh to sit in on the interview um, and do the interview. At the end of the interview, he asked me if I had any questions. And I said, no, I think I, I was, I, and I had said to me, to myself before I went in the agents for the interview, I said, this is, this is it. If I don't get in, I'm done. This has been, I've been messing with this a long time. And, uh, you know, my friends were still like, we're, we're going to figure this out one way or the other, keep doing it. And I'm like, no, this is ridiculous. So I go into the interview and I was a little bit snippy at the end. He had, the last question he asked me, he said, uh, do you have any questions for us? And I just kind of, I looked over at him and I said, sir, with all due respect, I think I answered all the, all my personal questions uh, in the past five interviews I did here this year. And he looked at me and he said, you interviewed here five times? And I said, this year. He said, I've been interviewing a long time. And he just shook his head he could, in disbelief. And uh, the next day he called me and he said, one way or another, I'm going to hire you. I said, okay. And it took him a year to hire me. I was there the second day. They told me to stay in my office, not come out of my office the first day. The second day, I was introduced to two people who were supposed to mentor me. One of them was really kind, and I'm still friends with that person. 
she had a high school diploma and um, certified addiction credential, certified addiction counselor, not a, not a licensed counselor, certified. The other certified counselor he introduced me to told him to get me out of her office that she would never work with me. She had never met me. She just didn't want any educated people around. About two months in to the job, one of the people told me that uh, took me kind of took me aside and had started confiding in, in me about some things. And she told me about a book burning where they burned all the AA books and they burned all the Bibles just a couple of years before I got there. And um, the staff was under the belief that it was illegal to talk about either of those because AA was a religion and it was illegal to talk about religion in a state agency. And then the guy that had hired me, you know, he had me in the office one day and was asking me all kinds of questions. We eventually got to talking about that. And he couldn't, he was in disbelief because he had grown up in that agency and didn't, he had heard a rumor, but didn't believe it. And um, then he decided he was going to sit in on some meetings. And as we said, he, he sat in on some meetings, one of the employees, you know, I mentioned AA and she jumped on me and said, you can't talk about AA in the state agency and um, it's illegal. And I said, yeah, that's what I hear. And I've heard it's illegal to talk about Bibles or any, any religion at all. And she said, that's exactly right. You need to remember that and you can't do, you know, and, of course, he's sitting there looking at us like, right, crazy. So he had me do a little paper on it. And after I did my little paper on it and disbunk, debunked this, the idea that it was illegal. And, and you have to understand, many, many years ago, there was a court case in Virginia, a lower court case that said AA was a religion and could not be in a state institution. But the next level of court threw that out. And people still fall back on that early decision. And um, so after he read the report, we talked a little bit, he said, do what you want. And uh, so I went to the Gideons and we got scriptures coming in. I mean, Gideon's coming in on the weekend talking to the men. Um, now, what's interesting to me, is, so that's kind of my background in, in dealing with, um, and if a Muslim come into the facility, I I, you know, if you ever look at the schedules for Muslim uh, prayers, it's extensive through the day. It's not just one or two times a day. It's extensive through the day. And so I had to set up a special spot for this man, um, produce the schedule, get the staff on board with it all, et cetera, get special permission and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not, it's not just Christianity or something like that. It's, it's about the spiritual concept. So um, fairly recently though, and I had always been aware of some people who were trying to involve the 12 steps in, in most people avoid getting an actual religion into the 12 steps, right? So AA doesn't push that. They just say a higher power and there's a big struggle, power struggle in AA over that issue. So, but now if you look up, um, Oh, shoot. Recovery Alive. Right. They're actually building church services around the 12 step process. And it's amazing. It really is amazing. So they, they work through the 12 step steps um, over a period of time. They have um, scripture related to it and do preaching upon it and all that stuff. And of course, they have um, praise music and all that. But then they have small groups. Now, one of those small groups happens after dinner. You have a dinner on Friday. They have a service after the dinner. And then they have the small group. It's kind of like an, a typical AA meeting, but brief. But throughout the week, they have small meetings that are mental health oriented. So they have uh, flyers, for instance, on anger. If you have an anger issue, you can go to this group. If you have an anxiety issue, you can go to this group. Depression issue, go to that group. Or multi, you know, they might cover multiple topics in one group. Schizophrenia, 
something like that. It's the only churches that are doing that are the ones that are based on the 12 steps and that sort of thing. So now, and now there's some people out there actually marketing to churches, suggesting that they will train people within the church to be peer support mental health professionals. So in the past few years, I mean, this, that idea, this concept of spirituality within the mental health and the um, church religion fields is just exploding. It's coming on really strong. So I, when you started, the, when you folks started talking about that, I thought it was really fascinating that mm. it, it hit home so hit home so strongly with me. It's consciousness. Once we become conscious, yeah, we can see. We can we can have a better handle on what is leading to truth. Yes. We can trust. And August, of all the 12 months of the year, August, in its heat and in its non-celebratory things, the from the ethers, consciousness is more flown out, flung out, sprinkled out than it is other times. <clears throat> to become conscious, to begin to, to think of. I know I like to think of it as my brother, he came out to see uh, me one day and he had this magazine and he was, he was short and he's in construction. And he showed me this, he pushed this magazine over to me and he said, look at that. And he said, I met, he said, that's my idea, I did that. And what it was, it was bridge builders that, that released the water you know, going on down the way and froze the dirt and reamed it out and filled it with concrete. And it took several days and it was a long time, you know, but that's how they, they built a bridge across this, what needed to be built across. Anyway, he said, I, I, that was my idea. I said, well, I don't see your name on here anywhere. And the thing of it is, I got to thinking about that because there's so many people that have so many right ideas. In the fullness of time, when it is time, it begins like little snowflakes just here and there. And it'll come down and a lot of people may grab onto it, but they don't do anything with it. And it's the one that has more of an understanding, more of an awakening to, more of taking this and actually holding on to it and developing it and running with it. Yeah. But it's in the fullness of time. It's not going to happen. And I don't remember what famous person said this, but it said that whenever a time, I'm paraphrasing, but whenever it is time for whatever the thing is to come, all of the armies in the world cannot prohibit it. Whenever it is time. Yeah. yeah, whatever it is, whenever it is time for that idea to be expounded, all of the armies in the world cannot prohibit it. I think it was Voltaire that said that, but I wouldn't <laughs> need to, I need to check it out. Important, yeah. So, um, so how was, did I, did I take us off course from the conversation that you were having in regards to the 12 steps and spirituality stuff? You added to it. Okay, thank you. You know, with the, uh, the, the formation of a kind of a religious church approach based on the 12 steps, still a spiritual thing, but also then a, you know, a nice, kind of format of doing it. <clears throat> I was going to, I was saying earlier, Jim, <clears throat> but I'm not uh, biblically very savvy. I had some exposure as a, a youngster, Sunday school, um, you know, and I know the Good Samaritan and I know somebody on the way to the well, something, you know, here and there. Uh, in fact, when I was in Turkey, in the I went to the community where 
the one of those uh, stories uh, had occurred. And I guess there are a good many of them in uh, locations in Turkey. But so uh, I, if somebody were to talk to me, uh, say I was, quote, in an official kind of helping counseling capacity, and they were to bring up a whole lot about God, religion, or what have you, uh, mm -hmm. as I say, it's not my strong suit. I, I don't, I've got the skills to honor what they're saying and to be active listening and to clarify. And I love the process and saying, well, how that's important to you. And when they say, well, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, uh, I'd rather spend time on you. Uh, you don't need me to agree or disagree with you. Our job is to clarify where you're at now and where you want to be going and see if we can facilitate you opening up the ideas to get there. But uh, the story I heard in the olden days, the preachers riding along in the buggy, maybe one horse, who knows, buggy, and he looks over and he sees Farmer Brown with a mule and a plow, and the farmer's got his hands on the plow, pushing, and the mule is pulling, and that sort of thing. And so the um, preacher gets down off his buggy and walks toward the farmer, or maybe the farmer walks in and something like that. And they say, hi, Adi, you know, how are you doing, that sort of thing. And the preacher looked around and he says, well, Farmer Brown, how long have you been here? Well, I had this about three years now. Well, God sure has been good to the land here. Mm. And the farmer said, well, I, I guess he has, but you should have seen it when he was working it by himself. When he was what? When he was when Tom was working the land by himself. Oh. You should have seen it when he yeah, when he was taking care of it. Not yeah, when he was taking care of it. <laughs> but what a wonderful story to to validate both, you know, the concept of the higher power, uh, the, the reason for being here, whatever. And yet, uh, as Mona said earlier, each person having free will. Some would work the plow and some wouldn't and would be moan that things weren't better and the others out there working the plow. And, 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 and people deserve credit for their work and they hate for it to be. I think there are some people that, that are so extreme on their religious beliefs that they want to credit everything to God or to the higher power and not give credit to the individual. Exactly, and um, that that'd be kind of hard to to contend with. But um, anyway, uh, and one that, of the other things, and you all have got this too. Um, I had I had not heard Glasser talk so much about religion or God or anything like that. And then one at one of the conferences, he always did role plays, and they they videotaped them. And so this was a, um, one of our colleagues from the audience is portraying a mother who comes home from school talking about, and maybe even had a, the kid had a copy of the chart or something like that. And the kid's telling the mother what they're teaching at school. And she's upset that they're teaching about choices, you know, and she doesn't see anywhere on the chart any mention of God. And that's important to her and, and her family. And so now she's come to see, oh, uh, Glass is the principal of the school. And, and so the woman comes in to see him. I'm, you know, I'm upset about this. And you all are teaching this. Uh, and, and then, my God, man, and so and so. And Glass just says, well, listen. Uh, we support, if you want to teach your child about God and, and all the good things there, you go ahead with that. We support that. You know, we, we're not a religious school. We're a public school here. But he said, now just, just for your information, God is in the chart. She said, what? 
Where, where, where? Well, right there in that area we call the quality world, you're teaching your child to put God's picture in his or her quality world. We're fine with that. Whatever you, your values and what have you that you teach like that. And so it was a nice way of, it, there was no picture of, of a quote or God-like persona, but, but the concept. And for some people, you've heard the term, you use the term part of the time, photo album for quality world. You know, here's my, so it, and then some would say for the active alcoholic or active drug user that alcohol or the drug was on page one of the album. Everything else was secondary, tertiary, to the picture of getting the alcohol, getting the drug. That made a lot of sense, too. They could just driven by that only. And um, then, of course, the whole process would be trying to help people find other quality world pictures that gave them the satisfaction, uh, so, at least to some extent, without the, the downside, you know. But, uh, and then also... Another way of seeing this essence is through the value filter, because it has to have some value either to embrace it or to fight against it, or it wouldn't be, move into the perceived world. Yeah. Now, and, and, and I may not, I say, my gosh, what would they be doing that for? Well, Wendell, do you know choice theory? Uh, I don't know what it is at the moment, but we can ask them. It's got some value to the person. It satisfies the need, power, whatever, you know? And so uh, that's the concept. And you just have to find out what it is. That's and, just and like. That's, that's a great, one of the great techniques is, is finding out something that the person's going for that's causing them trouble and what need is that satisfying for them so that we could say, then we could start looking at, oh, you'd like to get more power in your life. You'd like to feel more in charge, more respect or what have you, see? What if we could find some other ways for you to do that that didn't get you in trouble with the law or didn't get you, you know, whatever, you know, would you be interested in that sort of thing? Well, what are you talking about? I can't picture that. Well, that's what we do here. We help people find uh, different behaviors, things to do that help them get love and belonging, power and fun and freedom. Choice theory is just so universal. I've, I've said this before, and my belief is that choice theory, yeah, I've gone into uh, drug alcohol, alcohol counseling centers. I've gone to wilderness camps for kids. I've gone to Jewish family services uh, and lots of different programs to, you know, to do in-service training. And uh, one of my little phrases that said, well, uh, you know, Lorraine asked me to come here today and I was trying to figure out what I was going to talk about. But I, um, one of the things I want to talk about is, is uh, uh, why the things that you're doing were working so well. How do you mean? I said, well, I'm bringing a psychology with me that explains why the successes that you're having are successes. And it's, you know, it's because they're meeting people's needs to a great extent. They're, you know, it just is wonderful. And it, helped, and it also explains why some things aren't working because they're not helping people meet the needs and yeah well we're going to close up for now uh it was been nice just having an open forum here any addictive behavior across the board pornography drugs any food what any addictive behavior started out in a cuddly nascent form it was something that was need satisfying until it became so 
that urge for the thing of it is, is once you begin to get what you want, you want more, you want more, you want more, you want more, you want more. And it's not having that break to stop it, that where it, then it sets itself up. And uh, Wendell's going to be talking about that next week. I heard the story of a person that was so desperate to change. And so they had heard that let go and let God, let go and let God, let go and let God. So they cut out great big letters and pasted it on the wall where anytime they walked in the house, they could see that, you know, let go and let God. And they were, their life wasn't changing so much. And, and then one day the person got home and opened the door and looked at that big old, you know, mural that they had put on the wall. And it said, let go and let go. The tape had released its hold on the D and fallen to the ground and it was underneath the sofa. And the book, let go and let go. And it was just, you know, I could, you know, yeah, that weight is gone because it's always here. Mm -hmm. It's here, it's here. I just can't see it, can't touch it. But trust it, but trust it. So anyway, thanks for being here and uh, good mental health.